In the last video, we talked about the U tutorial and we went over what it's like to create functional components inside of U and we got this example working. This example being a bunch of paragraph tags in a list that we can then click and we'll show a detail view. That detail view is not particularly exciting. There is no video. It's only changing the title really, but it does work and we did get the JSON API request to actually work. But I have refactored the code and I wanna share that refactor with you today. In our main.rs, all we have is the u start app with the app type argument. This is our app component. It's the same component that we used in the last video. I've refactored that component specifically and moved the subcomponents out to a different file. So in lib.rs, we've got our app component. This code will look unfamiliar to you because it's new. And then in video.rs, we've got the video struct, the video details component, and the videos list component. So let's take a look at the videos module because that'll be the easiest to cover first. We've left this as a struct and a set of functional components. I think that this is pretty reasonable for these components. They really just display some props that they're given, but we do have to put pub on everything, like anything, anywhere. Um, we have to put it on the props struct itself. We have to put it on the fields of the props struct because the props get passed in and we potentially access them. We have to put it on the component definition itself. So you end up sprinkling a lot of pub around, but other than that, these are pretty much the same components that we had before. The videos list component also creates a callback. So we iterate over the list of videos. For each video, we create a callback that will, when fired, emit that video as an event. I think that writing the functional components like this is fine, but I think that the logic that we had in the app component with the API fetch wasn't super satisfactory for me. So I rewrote it into an app struct and an implementation of the component trait for app, which is the second way that you can write components in view. So we've got this enum message here and we've got this struct app. The app struct is where we keep sort of all of our state, all of the things that we want to manage inside of this component. The message enum are events effectively that we have to react to. To implement component, we have to define two associated types. One is message, which are these events that we're going to react to. And one is properties or props. This is unit in this case because it doesn't accept any props, but it would be one of the prop structs if we were doing this in the video RS file. We then have a couple of lifecycle methods is what I'm going to call them for now. We've overridden create, update, and view. View is going to look very similar to a functional component itself. It accepts the context of the component as well as a reference to the self. So a reference to its own struct, the app struct with all the data. And then we do the same thing effectively that we did in the previous video. This, this code is very similar to what we wrote to render our data last time. The only big difference is that we do context.link with dot callback for the on click. And the video that gets emitted from our on click inside of the list elements is going to come in here and we're going to pass that back as the select event or the select message for our component to handle. So that leaves us with create and update. Create is run when this component is created for the first time. So it's roughly equivalent to what we were doing with use effect in the last video. I've left most of the code the same so that you get a sense for what the refactor looks like. Instead of using wasm bind gen and spawning local or something like that, we get to use the send future function on context.link and we can pass that an async block. That async block uses the same request to the same URL that we used in the last video, except that when we get these videos back this time, we're going to return a message or send a message called set videos with the result. And finally, since that's an async function that isn't going to run until, you know, some potential point in the future, we have to initialize the app struct, which has videos and which video is currently selected. Our update function is where we handle the messages. So anytime we send a message, anytime we return a message from one of these other functions, we handle it here in update. In this case, if we're setting the videos, then we take the videos and we do self.videos equals videos. If there's an error in the request, we actually aren't handling that right now. So I just have a to do macro. And if we've selected a video, that video comes in as the argument here. And I set self.selected equals that video. 
overall, I kind of like this organization of logic better than the way that we were doing it before. I think especially when I look at this, it reminds me of building up a state machine. So it reminds me of setting a bunch of states for that we can be in and a bunch of transitions between those states and then responding to those using this component model. I'm hoping I can find a higher level way to write these components that sort of more directly associates itself with a state machine. But I do think I like this way of writing components that have data requirements compared to using the use effect model. I think the use effect model that we were using before suits JavaScript pretty well. But even if you look at React, for example, and you look at use effect, use effect is extremely confusing for people. I've seen a lot of, especially newer developers, but also pretty experienced developers, not understand what use effect is doing and when it's going to run or what the dependencies even are. So while I'm not sure that running this request when this component is created is the right place to put this fetch, it's at least obvious when that is happening. Now, looking at this from another perspective, I feel like there's going to be a stronger way to model our data. And one of those approaches is called Udux, which is a Redux equivalent. But even if we externalize this state, the external state, like the, the tutorial uh, video data, we still probably want to have some states, some state machine in here that tells us what state our component is in. Because quite often we have empty states, we have loading states, we have filled states, et cetera, for various UI components. And I think that that's still going to be a useful pattern for those situations, even if the actual data that we are rendering is coming from a remote resource. So I did that refactor and I wanted to share that because I think that this changes the way that I feel about data and using uh, that data in components inside of you. This is pretty verbose. I don't know, it's like 80 lines for this one component, but it is also pretty clear what's happening and when it's happening. Whereas the, whereas I think the use effect with depths approach that you see on the right here, I mean, it, it, it is clear in some ways, right? It's clear that we're spawning a future. It's clear that we are using a hook to do that, but it's not especially clear in terms of like what this unit means down here or what this closure means. And I think that maybe we just don't have to make the same mistakes if we don't want to. So when it comes down to it, we're doing the same logic here. We have this request get, and we get these fetched videos and we set them somewhere. Instead of having multiple layers nested, we have this use effect. We have a block around the use effect. We have a closure inside of the use effect that is the use effect we have a spawn local that also takes another async closure that we all have to then set the state from. In this case, we have the create lifecycle and the future that we're running, which we can then send our data to. So I feel like the mental model for implementing the component trait for a struct works out better than the mental model for hooks inside of you, inside of Rust. But that's kind of a personal opinion. So I think it's more straightforward to understand where the error handling would go as well. Because if we have an error on the left-hand side here, the data inside of the impl component, this request could easily return a message error for each of these errors. And then we would be able to handle that in our update function for this component and then choose to render those or not. Whereas in the use effect, where do we put that error? We have to kind of construct our state in a way that holds the errors if we want to keep them around. And we have to remember to do that every single time which may not sound like a large difference, but I promise you in practice, what happens is that these errors on the right-hand side just won't get handled because it's easier to not handle them. And it's harder to figure out where that error handling logic should go, which is one of the reasons X state is so useful on the front end because it manages the life cycle of these requests in a way that can transition from one state into another to load this data in. Now, there are other approaches to data loading. Like I've said before, there's uh, Redux on the JavaScript side or other Flux implementations, although Redux is the most popular of those. And then there's Udux on the Rust side, which we should do another video on. But there are even more approaches than that 
which have slightly different abstractions and different caches. So I think that this um, component implementation makes sense anytime you have async requests happening, anytime you have state happening. It is a little bit more code, but I think that reading it makes a little bit more sense to people who are approaching it for the first time or people who are coming back to that code. And that is a feature of the code that is really important to me, the ability for people to come here and read this and understand it. So I think I'll be going with the Impl component for my U apps, whereas I think the use effect with depths is something that I'm just not as interested in using, even though I find it very useful in the JavaScript side in the React world. That's it for today. I will catch you in the next video and have a great day.